Welcome, my name is Timothy Clancy. I'm the president and founder of Dialectic Simulation Consulting. This is the third episode of Problem Solving in Turbulence, which is uh, we do on the second and fourth Thursdays of the month. Uh, these are Facebook Live Ask Me Anything, where I go through concepts of systems thinking, uh, system sciences, often as they apply more to business or organizational needs rather than necessarily current events, though today we're gonna do a mix. Um, I've spent nearly 30 years of my life solving problems for companies, nonprofits, government agencies, the military, and part of these episodes is to share some of the tools and information I've accumulated uh, to help folks uh, understand the complex systems they work in and how to navigate what are obviously very turbulent times. Um, the linked uh, is you can see in the description of this, there's going to be links. And if you're watching this on YouTube, all the links are going to be in the comments below. Uh, today's episode is kind of a mix of current events and systems thinking. I'm actually going to use the US presidential election, which is obviously now fully underway, um, and use that as a proxy to help explore a lot of concepts of, of systems thinking and complex systems. Before anyone goes, oh no, that's the last thing I need is more politics in my day. I'm not gonna get into the politics on this. I'm not gonna get into any of the rhetoric. I'm mainly using it as something we're all familiar with, we're all experiencing right now, and using that election, and specifically election forecast models, as a proxy to help understanding of how complex systems work and operate. And throughout the episode, if you have questions, feel free to throw them up in the comments. I'll get to them and answer them as I can. And if you, if you happen to have questions afterwards, go ahead and leave them below. Again, we're gonna segment all these videos up, throw them up on YouTube. We've got the first two episodes are up now in, in the chunks there. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, So understanding complex systems through the U.S. election model, it's actually, despite how we're all sick to death and it's only early, you know mid-August, we're, we're all done with the presidential election cycle, it's a good example that we're all familiar with and we've all interacted in some way of what a complex system is. And I think people a lot of times in systems thinking don't realize, you know, they hear complex systems or complex adaptive systems and they think, oh, that's something scientific and, you know, physics or, or some high-end type of theory. And they don't realize these are the systems we actually interact with every day. These systems are all around us. They are small scale family systems to large scale systems like the presidential election. And with the presidential election, there's a lot of models that try and forecast this. And that makes it a good example to understand how we use simulation and models and some of the challenges and the benefits there and the differences when it comes to understanding complex systems and learning that through the US election. So um, the first thing is to kind of understand what kind of system is the US election. And this is a this gets into the terminology that you're gonna hear about systems. What kind of systems are there? And I've got some over there on the um, side of the screen there. You often hear about random systems, complicated systems, chaotic systems, and complex systems. And it's often hard to tell what's the difference. Well, let's begin with the simplest of these. A random system is truly random. It has no neither rhyme nor reason. It is literally down to the chance of a coin flip or the roll of a dice. And we often talk about randomness in our lives because what we perceive um, doesn't make sense. It seems like it's a random chance, but very, very few things in our lives are truly random. And so like the presidential election system, the presidential election, it's not a random series of events. A truly random system would be someone who waited until November 3rd, flipped a coin and went out and voted that way. Or um, random could be candidates who don't run get elected, which of course doesn't happen very often. Randomness is, is we, we, we perceive randomness because we can't see the connections that are going on in complex systems. And part of structured systems thinking is to make those connections visible. So what we perceive as randomness often has very valid reasons and it's a different kind of system, but to us as the observer, it's like, ah, it's just too much to understand. It, it's gotta be random. Well, very few human systems are random and that gets us to complicated systems. Complicated systems are ones that have lots and lots of parts in them. Uh, the trick is those parts are not necessarily interacting with each other in a feedback way. They tend to sort of operate in a linear fashion or there's lots of things going on, but they're not really 
creating closed feedback loops, which we'll talk about in a minute. So complicated systems are often mistaken as random just because there's so much going on at any point in time we look, the result going on in that complicated system may surprise us, but you know, uh, things like physics. Physics is a complicated system. There's lots of interactions of fundamental rules down from the particle level, all the way up to uh, how we live and experience the world. But you know, it, it's, it's those, it's complicated because there's a lot of things going on, but it's still discernible by simple rules that have cause and effect. Um, this distinguishes from chaotic sim systems. Chaotic systems, a lot of times people will um, describe a random system and use the term chaos and random interchangeably. And they're not really the same thing. There's a lot of confusion on what is a chaotic system. But a chaotic system is a system that is very sensitive to initial conditions. You'll hear the phrase, the butterfly flaps its wings in India and we have a hurricane in the United States. That's a description of a chaotic system because at first glance, it's seemingly random. How many butterflies are there? How many wings are being flapped? Why is it that one in particular? But the premise of a chaotic system is that if you had enough visibility, if you had enough observation, you could understand all the causal connections between that butterfly flapping its rings, a little air current going, that air current collecting with other air currents and changing them slightly. And pretty soon you got a storm pattern that's moving and uh, maybe it's coming off the coast of Africa, west to the Eastern United States as a hurricane system. You know, these things you could causally break it down and build. So chaos is not the same as random. And again, very, very few things are actually random. Most things are deterministic, but chaos has the appearance of random because we don't know um, all those things are going to happen. When it comes to the U.S. election, very chaotic system. Uh, we don't know, you know, when an interaction on a, uh, when people are going up and down that line, shaking hands and someone shouts something out and the candidate responds and that gets captured on a video. That's like the butterfly. That can seem very chaotic that those, um, permutations can often have really large consequences within the, the immediate scope of a campaign. So from chaotic systems, we get to complex systems. Complex systems are one where there's, it, it's not just that it's complicated, there's a lot of moving parts, but those parts influence one another in feedback. And this is what makes a complex system complex, is the existence of feedback structure. Uh, you know, if we had a chaotic system where someone could shout something and a candidate could respond on the line as they're shaking hands, and that really didn't have any influence, um, you know, that would, that would be one thing. But if all of a sudden people began reacting to that video and changing their donation patterns and or adjusting their allegiance or it affected the forecast models, that is an evidence of a complex system. And it gets confusing for people, this distinguishing of complex, because unfortunately the sciences have picked, there's two main types of sciences that deal with this description of systems. One is in physics and one is in system sciences. And they use very similar terms to describe complex systems, but they're actually mean different things. So in physics, you'll hear of an open system or a closed system. And most physics, the experiments deal with closed systems. A closed system in physics means that there are no external influencers. They've isolated um, a portion of the environment. And you also see this in economics, um, Petr Sarbalis, which is all else being equal, right? We've isolated everything else. We've eliminated all externalities. We've just isolated the phenomenon we look at. That's a closed system in physics. An open system is one where there's external influences and energies being fed into the experiment or the observation, which of course, if you think about it, it's a lot easier to deal with a closed system because you've isolated all those external um, factors. But that's not a very complex system because you've limited that feedback effect which is what leads to the description in system science of open loop and closed loop. <laughs> now, don't get these confused. An open loop system in system science is like a closed system in physics. An open loop system means that cause creates effect and that's it. It's a very linear description. A closed loop system in system science means that as cause creates effect, effect loops back to influence cause. It's closed the loop. Think of it as closing the circle, creating one of those feedback loops I often show. So a closed loop system is one that has feedback effects within it. Um, 
So w where does this leave us with the U.S. election? What kind of system is the U.S. election? Well, it's an open system from a physics perspective because it has all the externalities influencing it, the economy, the pandemic, how your parents raised you, what the influence of your friends are, social media, what's going on overseas, political parties, the history of political parties, all of these externalities are coming in. So it's an open system from a, a physics perspective and it's a closed loop complex system from a system science because these things aren't just happening in isolation. If they were all isolated, it'd be complicated. But because how your parents may have raised you and the influence of your friends changes you, you likewise may have an influence on your parents or an influence on your friends creating a closed loop feedback system. And this is playing out on all over the area. And that's why the US election system is a very complex system to consider. So let me check here and see if there's any questions. Would a, Mike uh, is asking, would a complicated system be something as simple as a general contractor schedule for a new construction job? That is excellent, Mike. Um, Mike's, Mike's talking about a complicated system. Imagine you've got a work breakdown structure or a project plan for doing a remodel or a build or something like that, that um, you need to list. There's, there's 500 different items you've got to do in that list and everyone's got their assignment and they've got to be laid out in a certain order. You can't put the walls up till you get the wiring done. You can't paint until the walls are done. You have this critical path, all this project management. That is complicated. That's not complex. When that scheduling becomes complex is let's say you get to the end of the project and you've done something wrong. And the client comes and starts reviewing it. They're doing a safety inspection. They're doing some other inspection. And they realize that the wiring was done wrong. The feedback now says you've done this wrong. The feedback effect takes you back and you have to redo those kind the, that, that element of the project. And a larger feedback may be that the client doesn't like the fact you did work long and it cost time and money to redo and now they want to hire you less often so you get less work. So you can go often from a complicated system, which is typically what we use a lot of times just for managing things, and step up a level by adding those externalities and those feedback loops and understanding how it becomes complex. A, so a contracting job is complicated. A contracting business is complex because it requires the feedback of past clients, their experience, their willingness to buy from you again, referrals. All of those things are now examples of this closed loop feedback system that makes any one job in isolation suddenly become part of a much larger, uh, more interactive system. So that's a great example of uh, what, the, what the difference is there. So, We've talked about random systems, chaotic systems, okay, uh, complex systems, complicated systems. What about path dependency? Path dependency in a system is, um, you can think of it like as a thought experiment, right? Systems can be path dependent or path independent. But imagine you have a bowl, right? It's a large mixing bowl like you're doing, and you have a marble. If you turn that bowl upside down so the open parts facing the floor and you put a marble on the top you can balance that marble on the very top so now you've got a marble on the very top of the bowl if you give that marble a nudge in any direction it's going to hit the slope downward and it's going to take off and, and roll across the floor that is a path dependent system what that means is a small initial nudge of energy in any direction creates path dependency once that marble gets rolling, gravity is going to take it and it's going to drop it down that slope and roll it across the floor. It's not going to turn around and come back up to the top and balance itself. Those are path dependent systems. Path independent systems is if you take the bowl and turn it right side up, so the open side's facing up, you put the marble in the center of the bowl and now if you give it a nudge, it will go a little bit up the side of the bowl, but then gravity will pull it back down in the center of the bowl. And so path independency means that even if you're giving it energy, you can't get it to veer away from the same path it was going to be on. And that's the difference between path dependency and path independency. Uh, how does this relate to the US election? The US election as a system, any one election at times feels very path dependent. You know. Who got out front with fundraising and publicity? Who won the early primaries? Those initial energy motions 
feel like they create a path which is going to go off and not be able to come back and and go in a different direction. It feels very path dependent. Um, you know, it, first mover advantage. You know, did you did you break out of the fundraising and get more money than the other person early on? Did you get early supporters? These are all characteristics of path dependency. But in a larger context, the U.S. electoral system is very path independent. We have a winner-take-all election. That means a two-party system is going to be favored. It's very difficult, no matter how much energy you put into hitting that marble, if you're a third party or a candidate that doesn't come from one of the main parties or isn't one of the main favored ones, you can put a lot of energy in and it may go up a, a bit onto this curve in a path independence, but it's gonna fall back and settle in that because these are, and, and what these two things mean, path dependency or path independency has to do with the feedback loops that we talk in this complex structure. Positive or compounding feedback loops take in energy and compound it on top of each other. It's reinforcing, it's accumulating, compounding, doubling. So as you flick that marble in a path dependent system, it's got a positive feedback loop. It gains a little acceleration and then more and more and more and that drives it out uh, to go further. Path independent, these are called negative or balancing feedback loop dominant systems. You can put a lot of energy in, but the, the dominant forces of the system are going to take that energy, exhaust it, and drive it right back into that marble resting in the center of the bottom of the bowl. And a lot of people, I, you know, if I could explain a lot of reactions I see on Facebook to every presidential election cycle, it's this tension between path dependency and path independency. I thought my person was a front runner. I thought I had a shot, but the two-party system... Um, dominates that balancing feedback effect. There are things that are going to constrain, and that's why you tend to see a narrow range of outcomes. And all governments have these two tensions in them as a system. But what's important to understand as a complex system is all complex systems are going to have elements of path dependency and path independency. The question to ask is which is uh, dominant. Um, Ms. Falkenberry is asking, is the election a chaotic system, not a complex system? I'd say it's more of a complex system than a chaotic system um, because it does have scenarios in it where feedback affects. Chaotic systems are often typified by the initial small uh, perturbation of the system creates the, the butterfly flaps its wing and we get the hurricane election systems have enough complexity and enough feedback that even with that that small initial thing can be overwhelmed by later feedback effects. Take, for example, what I just described as path dependency and path independent. If the, the U.S. system was completely path dependent, there was no balancing feedback in that system. It wasn't complex in that regard. Yeah, it may be more chaotic, but because of the strength of those balancing feedback loops, that, that bowl that's right side up where the marble's at the bottom and you flick it and it goes up and comes back down, there are certain balancing effects in this complex system that drive, regardless if you're the third party candidate and like, this is probably going back in time, Ross Perot had a great third party candidacy historically, got a lot of attention, a lot of momentum, really was on the debate with the presidents, but the path independency, the, the, the balancing focus of those complex system drove the results back to that two-party uh, system. Um, and so that's the, that's kind of to understand this, this concept. And these, again, these are, Mike, you might want to think about in contracting, what's path dependent and path independent in, 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 in your line of work. What are things that, you know, with a, with a, um, a small amount of energy, things can take off without ever looking back. That, that's path dependent versus over time, it all sort of comes back to that center mean area. And I don't know much about contracting, but I've done some theater productions. And it seems like early on when you're doing a theater production or a play, you have no idea how it's going to work. It's, it's, it's everything's falling apart. It doesn't look like anything's happening on time. But as you approach that deadline, stuff starts to get together. People kind of drill down. You have that meeting where everyone gets together and decides to be really serious. You work out your bugs and your, your effects. And all of a sudden you pull that play off on the deadline. I imagine contracting is similar that as you get closer to the deadline, that balancing effect of we're going to finish this and we're going to get it done begins to exert itself. But I'm just, I'm guessing on that because that's not a field I, as familiar with. Um, so what are some of the, now we've, so the, the, the U S election system is a complex system it has elements of path dependency and path independency in it. 
what are some of the problems of forecasting in these systems, right? How, wh when we talk about predictions and forecasts, and, and again, the U.S. election is a great example for all complex systems, because what I'm going to say here applies to not just the elections, but all systems. First, George Box has this famous quote. He's a mathematician. All models are wrong. Some are useful. When we create a simulation of model, the real world, we're not creating the real world. We can't, by definition, recreate the entirety of the real world, because if we did, we'd just use the real world. We're always making choices of abstraction and design and what kind of data we have or what access or what resources or limitations we have. All models are a series of choices that are basically saying we're going to take the entirety of reality and simplify it to be able to make a useful prediction. And that's why it, it's true. All models are wrong. You'll never find a perfectly right model of a complex system. The question is whether they are useful because I don't need to model every single individual voter to be able to make a forecast on the US election. I mean, that would be incredibly difficult to do and the chances of error would be high and it probably wouldn't be any much better than a simpler model. But another challenge is unlike, you know, the US election, um, any sort of single event, you cannot, it, you can't run a double blind placebo in the real world. You know, with a medical trial, you can give, if you have a medicine, like say we get a vaccine for the coronavirus, we can say half the patients get the vaccine, half don't. We're going to do a double blind placebo test. We'll see how they do. You can't split the U.S. in half and have half run a real election and half run a fake election. You can't, this is why modeling complex systems is used. We use simulations because in the real world, we can't, run a double blind test. We can only do it once. We have one shot. But in a simulation, you can run as many tests as you want because it's all synthetic. It's all in the simulation. And, and, and this gets to another point is that in the real world, you could never run an experiment the same way twice. Think about all the things that were in place in 2019 when the presidential campaign started between the Democratic um, contenders uh, seeing who would go up against President Trump, right? Even if you froze that at a point in time, First of all, you probably couldn't replicate all the factors that would happen um, to be able to run that again a second time as an experiment. Second, different things might happen, right? Different events in the world might happen or not happen and very small changes. And this is where uh, Ms. Falkenberry, the concept of chaos comes in. Seemingly small changes throughout the complex system means that second experiment, that second run through could have very different outcomes because you can't run the same test twice. You can never recreate the conditions. You can never isolate all the conditions. And finally, unique events are unique. This is the challenge of calling something like um, the presidential election. It only is going to happen once on November 3rd. You, you, it's not a series. If there were a hundred presidential elections, you could make a more useful prediction of um, saying that, you know, we're going to have uh, you know, there's a, of these hundred elections, so many percent of them are going to go one way and so many percent are going the other, but there's only one election. It only happens once. So probability becomes tricky because what are you giving a probability on? Um, and this gets into, uh, this question of some more problems with forecasting before I get into the question of the probability. In a complex system, you have to ask which feedback loops are dominant. Remember that path dependent versus path independent. Well, if you have positive or compounding feedback loops that are dominant in a system, that means things are going to double over the doubling period. Uh, it's that like compounding interest, right? Or compounding growth. Things are doubling at a constant rate. The question is, what's your error margin? Because an error margin is a component of that system. And if everything's doubling at the doubling rate of the period, then your error margin is going to double too. So if you start out with a prediction that has only a half a percent of an error margin, but the doubling rate of the system is weekly. That means every week your error margin is going to double from a half percent to a percent to 2% to 4% per 8% per 16%. Pretty soon you have an error margin so large, your model's not very useful. And this is why we can't predict the weather more than a few days out. It's, it's positive feedback loop dominant in the local conditions of, of the environment. Now, climatologically speaking, we can say there's probably more balancing feedback loops, but certainly in local weather, it's very hard to predict more than a few days out because of this doubling effect. Likewise, stock market, no one can predict the stock market because of this, 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 even if you had a very, very small error margin, very quickly, it would be doubled to the point where your error margins effectively won. Um, this is different from a negative feedback loop system 
where the, you know, you, instead of a doubling effect, you have a halving effect over time. And that means your error margin is also halving over time. And this is why, for example, when we do carbon half-life dating, that's a, a system dominated by balancing feedback. The radioactive decay of the, the material is a balancing feedback loop. And it the error margin has, which is why we can date things tens of thousands of years in the past pretty accurately, but can't predict the stock market a month from now, it's because the two systems that we're dealing with are dominated by different um, kinds of, of, of feedback loops. And understanding these feedback loops, the US presidential election, it's a human system. Most human systems are dominated by positive feedback loop. The presidential election is no difference. And so some of the things that you know, forecasters do to mitigate this is they'll they'll sample frequently. They won't rely on a forecast made once, months in advance. They'll regularly sample in those opinion polls. But you have to be very careful and aware that any of these predictions in a system like the U.S. election are going to have that error margin. The longer it goes from when that prediction is, is made, the higher that error margin is going to be. Now, this leads, you've heard me use the term predictions and forecasts. And these are important to understand because they're different, they mean different things. So what is, first of all, let's talk about an event. An event is a thing that's going to happen at a point in time. Uh, you could say it's the primary results of a specific primary, the election results, a specific debate performance. These are events. They are point values at points in time, very distinct. A scenario compared to an event a scenario is a behavior over time and the causes which cause that behavior to manifest. So if I say that I have a you know scenario that I'm in the presidential election and I'm getting lots of money coming in, the scenario should say, what's the behavior of that fundraising over time and describe, well, I got this many from um, small donors, this many from large, um, large donors, this many from PAC, super PACs, you know, it would causally explain how that behavior pattern came to be. And it's not trying to make a point value prediction at a point in time. It's not saying at Thursday, two months from now, your fundraising total will be X million dollars and 22 cents. It's generally describing a behavior pattern. Is it going to go up sharply and then flatten off? Is it going to flatline and then go up? Is it going to be wavy? It's describing a behavior pattern. And more importantly, what are the causal mechanisms that are causing this scenario to exist? This, I think, and in elections, it's not just fundraising, but get out the vote campaigns, your ground game, your coalition building, you're building your support. All of these things can be described as scenarios and they're different from events. So a prediction is a probability of an event happening. You see predictions of, well, what's the probability that uh, Trump versus Biden or Biden versus Trump is going to win on November 3rd? A forecast is a collection of scenarios any one of which may come to pass, but each of which has a distinct causal structure of what caused that outcome to arrive at. And this is very different um, from how a lot of people, so I mean, let's, let's, let's talk about some of the challenges here of how um, 538 is doing this. Uh, 538, for those who don't know, is one of the premier political statistic quant nerd websites. And you know I like them a lot, I, I use them, I'm not gonna knock them, but I think they're a good example because most people are gonna be familiar and they just released their presidential forecast. So the question now is with all these terms on systems thinking, we can now look at the 538 thing and ask, are they making a prediction or forecast. So I grabbed a couple graphics from their site. This is what's on their page right now. And the forecast is, and they're calling it a forecast, but I'm challenging. Is this a prediction or a forecast? Let's look at the chart. They have a chance of winning, a percentage range, and it shows here that 72 and 100 um, uh, versus 20 and 100. The blue is for Biden, the red is for Trump. Well, this is why I don't like predictions of events. They're, they're establishing a probability. First of all, from a soundness principle, any sound model should be falsifiable. If I have a prediction that says in a two candidate race, we're almost, we're virtually guaranteed that one of those candidates is going to win. Unless I have a prediction that's 100% to 0%, any outcome of that race that consists of one or the other winning, I could claim was in my probability range. Even if it's 99 to one, because the election only happens once, it's a unique event. Let's say it's 99 to one. And that 
one person wins, I could say, well, see, there's a 1% chance they won and they won. I'm within my probability. This is why I don't like predictions of, of elections, probability predictions. It doesn't provide useful information because there's nothing falsifiable in this probability. Um, you know, if now what would be useful is there's a 25% chance someone you've never heard of is going to win the election. That would be interesting if it happened. If it came to pass, that would be interesting. But probabilities tend to break down in these unique events because you cannot, remember, complex systems. You, you cannot run the same experiment twice. You cannot have a unique event occur multiple times. We can't have 100 presidential elections and count how many times Biden won versus how many times Trump won. We're only going to have one. And this leads a little bit to, I think, the question of did 538 get the prediction wrong in 2016? And this was a very famous call they made that looks a lot like that, you know, it was 7822 Biden to Trump in the previous slide. When they made the call for Clinton, it was 71.4 for Clinton, 28.6 for Trump, virtually the same numbers. And they're getting a lot of grief. Now, a couple things of difference. Remember I talk about in complex systems, one of the way you defeat that doubling error rate is you sample very frequently. Well, they were, you know, right now we're in this August frame here. Um, they were making sampling and calls all the way up to the very end, so the final forecast. So they are trying to do that, that sampling and statistics. But it still has that same percentage. This threw off a lot of people. 71% chance Clinton wins, 28% chance Trump wins doesn't mean Clinton's always going to win. But you can't tell that in a unique event. You tend to think, well, Clinton's going to win because she has the higher percentage. But that's not what that means. And that's why this is a very um, confusing forecast. Um, the, and Ed's asking a great question. Do I think this perspective is related to Nate Silver's background in sports analytics? Absolutely. I think the feedback effect here, so Nate Silver runs 538 and he comes from sports analytics and sports analytics are often doing forecasts where they're looking at um, behaviors over time of individual players, how those behaviors contribute to wins and losses over a season. Now, wins and losses are not unique events. Each game is a unique event, but the collection of wins and losses is kind of like, here's a bunch of scenarios, and the accumulation, those, those player behaviors are the, the, the causative mechanisms by which you win or lose a game. And we can say over a season of 16 football games that 12 are won and, eight are, uh, and four are lost, that can actually be closer to bear out because you actually have 16 games to play. Um, and I think he got a little bit sideways when they do this presentation of probability for single unique events. I think they're, they're kind of blending those concepts together. But to Nate Silver's credit, he did something. And what 538 did is on the morning they made this forecast, they explained, and this is, I took this, I just grabbed this this morning. This is still up there from November 8th, 2016. They described the ways they could be wrong. And this is a sign of a good modeler. They In the forecast, they said Clinton has a 72% or 71%. Trump has 29 They said, these are the three ways we could be wrong. First, there's a margin of error in the polling error, and it's not a high one, so that could be discounted. The number of undecided and third-party voters is much higher. And the location of Clinton supporters tends to congregate in states that were already going to go for Clinton anyways and don't provide an electoral advantage. So the way I describe 538 getting it wrong in 2016 is they blew the, the prediction like everyone else, but they got the wrong absolutely right. By that, I mean, they said before it happened, if we're wrong, this is how we're going to be wrong. And I think they were pretty accurate in that regards. That's a neat trick of forecasting. If you read my forecasts, like any of the New York Eve, uh, New, Year, New Year's Eve, ask me anything, I'll make a forecast of what's going to happen in the world in the year ahead based on what people ask me. But then I'll say, if I'm wrong, this is the way I'm going to be wrong. And that's an important thing to put in there as a, a, to understand about systems is it's not just about getting it right. It's about understanding the causal actions of why something came to pass. And that leads us to the current 538-2020 forecast. I think they've learned a lot in four years, and you can still see they've got this kind of probability uh, thing on their headline page, that percentage. I hope they get away with that, because what's further down the page, if you scroll, is this graphic. 
Biden is favored to win the election. And they've got a graphic here where they show we simulate the election 40,000 times, then they sampled 100 outcomes. And now these outcomes are, are placed showing where they are on an electoral score. So now you've got something that says an electoral score is a combination of states. They have made a forecast. Each one of these is a scenario now. Rather than doing a prediction that's saying a 72%, they're saying, look, out of 100 scenarios, 72 of those scenarios, Biden wins. And I imagine if you could go into each one of these dots, it would be a different configuration of state by state results that generated an electoral college that generated this point score. And then here's the one that Trump wins. Why this builds confidence. So in systems thinking, we're dealing with complex systems. We're always trying to build confidence in our forecast. Remember, Biden or Trump's going to win pretty much guaranteed. One of those two is likely to win, barring some extreme outlandish event, hard to predict. One of those two is going to win. So it doesn't help me to just say, well, 72%, 80%, but each one of these dots behind the scenes is a scenario of how they win. If I don't just tell you Biden's going to win, but I say the exact uh, uh, combination of states he's going to take that generate an electoral score, electoral college score, that builds confidence. If Trump happens to win, it's one of these 28 scenarios. And one of these 28 scenarios correctly describes the states that he won and by how much that builds confidence. This concept of confidence building is that it's, I've done the steps that you can have confidence that I'm not just claiming credit for something I didn't earn. I describe now the caveat here is that under normal conditions, there's only six to eight battleground states. The combinatorics of those aren't that high. You could, with a hundred scenarios, you could, you know, and the different ways those battleground states could go or a couple swing states, you could cover the wide variety of scenarios that would result in a Trump or a Biden win. But, um, and they have this little friendly, friendly graphic down here that says, don't count the underdog out, upset wins are surprising yet frequent. And I think that's them trying to get out of the doghouse they dug themselves in, in 2016. Um, so this is, we can use these, these, these complex systems. A U.S. presidential election is a complex system. We can use to understand a lot of systems thinking concepts and, and we can build upon this as we go into um, more and more uh, discussion about complex systems, these concepts of path dependency, path independency, whether it's a chaotic system versus complex versus complicated. These are things you're gonna see come up over and again. So I'm gonna pause and see if there's any questions right now. Um, before I head into the last part here, which is a uh, getting into a system archetype pattern. So I'll pause and see if there's any questions. Okay. So a uh, question by Ms. Falconberry, interesting book by Neil Stevenson called Faller, Dodge, and Hell. It is a novel about a programmer. Oh, this is a long question. Is it possible to create a simulation that does take into account the personality and psychology of an entire simulation and then run several tests, even if there would be several very different outcomes? Are you asking whether there's, it's possible to create a simulation that takes into account the personality and psychology of a person or of a simulation? Because there's, 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 the answer is yes, but in very different ways. So let me, let me split the question and, and try and answer both here. Um, when you're simulating human psychology, there are some very robust models. Sandia National Labs, you can Google it, put out something called the, uh, towards the unified cognitive or unified psychocognitive engine. Uh, there's a PDF, it's about 60 pages. I've worked with some of these folks. They're modeling decision-making in short spans of time. We're talking seconds to two weeks, a single decision. And what they do is they take a group of people. There's a paper out there that says, looks at um, cohorts of, of children smoking in high school. And they're trying to examine the psychology of why does a, why does a, a student choose to pick up smoking. But Sandia National Labs also does a lot of the national security work for the US government. And these models are also used to say, how would Putin react to a certain stimuli? Or how would um, the, the leader of North Korea react to a certain 
um, overture diplomacy wise and you can use these models they're very difficult to put together you need a lot of if you're doing it on a single person you obviously need a lot of data about that person but it's basically designed to recreate the cognitive process as best we understand it in the human brain and it's pretty cool how they built it together they brought together economists psychologists and system scientists all of whom have different theories about how decision making occurs and what they did is they sat down as a group and each one had to put forward their best theories and then as a group they had to all agree on a theory for it to stay in and if there wasn't consensus among the three different groups yeah that theory is pretty right it got tossed out what they were left is a subset of theories that all three different disciplines could agree upon and then they mathematically created a model and simulation that could replicate the results of those theories it's a really fascinating project and that means that yes you can build a simulation that replicates human decision making um, even down each person. It's very labor intensive. So um, a different use of this model that I was involved in is, is, is just in discussion wise is, can you replicate how an ethnographic group is going to react in Iraq or Syria as ISIS comes barreling into their neighborhood? Now, this is a decision making where ISIS, uh, the Islamic State of Syria and Iraq, they were conquering lots of territory. They're a thousand miles away. Um, what happens to an ethnographic group as they realize that this is, well, it depends on what the perception of ISIS is, what the perception of the state actor, but what we were able to determine is there's an effective fear shockwave that would precede ISIS by probably around 500 miles. That as they advance toward population centers, those ethnographic groups would begin acting, at realizing this was coming down the way and begin making choices and decisions that would in some ways destabilize the area before ISIS even arrived because you would start having um, Sunni Arabs and Shia Arabs and uh, Sunni Kurds and all that beginning to conflict with one another. So you, it's easier to model a group than it is an individual. And these, because of that um, error margin effect, these positive, they're very limited time, usually only a few seconds or at most a few weeks. You can't use it to say, what's gonna be the result of my PhD course, much to the chagrin of anyone who's ever taken PhDs. Um, and so that's that's how that works. So uh, wanted to shift from discussion of complex systems to a system pattern for this week, which is uh, archetype loop. And what I've got here, uh, go to the lab. Here we go, here's the lab. This should show up now. This is a system pattern or what we call a system archetype of a feedback structure of a very common effect called the attractiveness principle. So the attractiveness principle is um, in general is any time a person or business has to make a choice between two equally attractive yet mutually exclusive strategies and and what happens when they they make that choice and i want to walk through the feedback loops one by one and then show how it's in effect now we're using covid 19 as an example to illustrate this but as with all these system patterns all that i did to change and make it covid 19 was change the words here to make the content the system structure is ubiquitous so you'll find this in other areas that have the same sort of um underlying conditions, this system pattern will prevail. But on the left side, you have this business success or failure. So we're talking now about a business that has to decide to open or stay closed during COVID-19. And obviously they have a business strategy that leads to more business revenue, but more business revenue leads to more strategy. This is now a positive feedback loop. If you get more revenue, you can execute more things, make more choices. We've kind of consolidated strat a lot of things into strategy here, basically the success and health of the business. But if you start losing business revenue, then you can make less choices. And because you make less choices, you have less business revenue and it becomes, so these positive feedback loops are often described as virtuous, that's where the compounding growth is working in your favor and vicious where the compounding growth is working against you. The switch that determines how this positive feedback loop, whether it's in a virtuous or vicious state is determined by this feedback structure on the right. And this consists of two balancing feedback loops, one of which is the strategy of we're going to provide quality service to people um, open up and provide services to people so we can make some money. The other is the uh, strategy of we're gonna do as much as we can to um, be safe within COVID-19 safety measures, and that may include closing down or limiting quality services. Now, this is the key for the attractiveness principle. This isn't a choice where you get to do both at the same level. It's a trade-off between these two strategies, both of which are attractive. People wanna be safe from COVID and people wanna go out and get things for services. So what's happening is the 
the power of each feedback loop is determined by this unseen mount. The extent of community spread of COVID-19 is determining to what extent there is going to be pressure to have COVID-19 safe. Um, and the other is the desire to consume services. Both of these elements are sort of hidden from the business owner. They can't tell where the, the population is gonna go. So they have to make a choice in ambiguity and they have to allocate resources. If I allocate recourses to opening and providing quality services and goods, those are resources I can't use for safety. Likewise, if I use resources for safety, those aren't resources I can use. So this is, now this isn't perfectly binary. There's gonna be some things that are a happy middle ground, but for the most part, these are now equally attractive, but competing strategies where you pick one or the other, and it's gonna have an influence on your success as a business. So let's take a look at how this um, plays out. Share this other screen up. So this is now, this infographic kind of encapsulates this and puts it in this a context. So you, we have here on the right, that system pattern I just described with some um, headlines indicating the red or blue pressures, right? So the Wall Street, both of these are headlines from the Wall Street Journal. One is from May 13th, company's next coronavirus challenge, getting cash strapped shoppers to spend, right? This headline from the Wall Street Journal reflects this lower blue group and this desire to consume services and goods and the pressure to open and provide those that is on business. This July 10th headline, also from the Wall Street Journal, as COVID-19 cases hit records in US, deaths begin to trending higher. This is the fear of a wave 1.5, and this represents this upper red feedback loop where you've, you've got the extent of spread of COVID-19 and it increases the pressure for save it. And the challenge here is how do you navigate trade-offs between competing limits to growth in order to select the most attractive strategy and sustain growth, right? That's the challenge of the attractiveness principle archetype. And what you see down here is, is one potential manifestation of the system. Remember, system structures can manifest many behaviors. But what I did is I laid out um, to clear the charts. The color coding of the line corresponds to the behavior of the loop. So the green line means what's going on in the green loop. The blue line is what's going on in the blue root loop. And the red line is what's going on in the red loop. And it has this services versus COVID-19 safety pressures what it's showing is the pressure over time versus revenue. So let's say that there's an increasing pressure to open. This is the blue, desire to consume. So you have this increasing pressure and the safety pressure is there, but it's low. So you choose the attractive principle of we're gonna open because that's where the pressure is. And we're gonna provide services, goods and services. And you can see this increasing pressure, but all the, and, and your, your revenue goes up, your revenue is now high, you're making money. Then the loop flips on you. Right, this is what happened. I'm, I'm displaying the, the basically what happened here in the last month. As the COVID-19 community spread blew out under wave 1.5, the pressure to have safety rapidly increased and you have a threshold effect right here. You, you hear these phrases, tipping points. The tipping point is this system is when the ratio of the pressure to be safe reaches a threshold that it begins eroding the pressure to deliver services. And you can see that that erosion of revenue actually occurs before the intercept. The intercept is where one line crosses the other. This is one of these tricky things of system dynamics and complex systems. By the time you recognize it, you've already felt the pain of it for some time. So this is why you need to use these archetypes to, to get ahead of the game and to see a little bit into the future and react to it. So in this scenario, COVID-19 pressure escalated. They were caught having picked the wrong strategy and their revenue suffered for it. Now, a different scenario, one that's not depicted might be they chose to be COVID-19 safe. They put all their money into being safe, but the community spread never reignited. There was never a wave 1.5. They spent all this money and all those other businesses that have better services and quality without all those safety measures are getting the revenue and they're still hurting. There's also ones where they, you know, they balance the choices out. So these system patterns can demonstrate in a lot of different manifestations. And it's, it's, understanding how each of those forecasts, again, that, that one behavior mode is a simple forecast. It's saying, here's something that could happen and how you would see it happening as it did, what conditions create it. Um, and we use these system patterns to kind of make multiple forecasts. Um, so that's, that's the system pattern of attractiveness principle used in the context of COVID. I'm gonna pause to see if there's any questions. We're at the top of the hour. Um, I appreciate everyone listening in. Again, we'll, we'll 
meld the edits of the videos together so that that crash that happened in mid kind of disappears and we'll post everything up on YouTube. But are there any more questions on anything we've covered today from uh, complex, complex, the types of systems to um, how the US election is a complex system to predictions versus forecasts to the attractiveness principle? And if you haven't yet, again, while people are typing in any questions, um, I'll be doing these videos now on the second and fourth Thursday of the month. They're going to be pretty simple, two or three topics, trying to get a little bit more into systems thinking. But if you haven't yet, like or follow the dialectic simulation page. That will let you know when the events are coming up. Um, again, we have a YouTube channel. The link is in um, there, and I'll post these up as we get these cut. We'll probably have the full episode up tomorrow and the individual segments up next Thursday. So. I, I don't see any final questions, so I'm going to go ahead and call it. Thanks, everyone, for attending today. Um, if you can, stay inside. If you can't, stay safe. Everyone be good. Take care. Bye-bye. Appreciate your time today. If you have any questions on structured systems thinking, have a problem you'd like our help on, or want to know more about developing your own capabilities in systems thinking, please reach out at the email below. We'd love to hear from you. If you're interested in what we do and want to follow our journey, I've added our LinkedIn and Twitter information. And we plan to regularly update this channel with quick tips and case studies to help you get the most out of your systems thinking and lean efforts. If you want to be notified whenever we add new video content, please consider subscribing to this channel by clicking on the red subscribe button below this video.